to exalt you to the highlight of our life because of the Lord Jesus, your Son. He gave His life for us. He died on Calvary's cross so that we might have this abundant life. And then, Lord, the Holy Spirit of God. He's with us. Our bodies as believers become the temple of the Holy Spirit. He's our power. He's our adoration. He's our comforter. He's our strength. He's our direction. God, this morning, we find peace in the presence of God. So, Lord, it's your day. It's your worship. God, I pray that you'd meet with us. God, that you'd be glorified. God, for any individual in this place today who has not made you Lord of their life, God, it could be today when you just touch them in a special moment and you draw them into the kingdom of God. And they say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. God, that's our prayer. May you find us faithful as we share your love one to another in Christ's name. Amen. Turning to your neighbor.
when you get your worship guide, you open there's a little card inside. It's called, we call it a get connected card. It's your way to kind of join with us. We want your information. If you would share your information with us. Also, for our church family to be able to share their touches, the way you input somebody this week. Uh, uh, maybe you had an opportunity to pray with somebody. Maybe you were having coffee at one of the restaurants or one of the uh, grocery stores or whatever. You had a chance to talk to somebody about Jesus or you went through the line and the cashier, whatever the case may be. And you were able to touch them with the name of Jesus and uh, minister to them in some form or fashion. And uh, if you would, just put a note on there about that. And uh, we would love to have that. If we're able, if you got some prayer requests, you can share that with us. That's what that card's for. And you can put that in the offering plate just a little bit later in the service. That's a gift. That's your offering this morning. We don't expect you to, uh, to give or participate from that standpoint as God leads you. But you can drop that card uh, in the offering plate when it's passed in just a little bit. Right now we've got a video. Casey's in our Christmas video up. Ready? Yes, sir. The, uh, if, we want you to pay attention to the video. And it uh, has to do with the Yankee Armstrong Easter offering. Uh, today is our harvest Sunday for that. Our goal is $1,200. And uh, we'll be observing that the whole week of uh, the whole month of April. And for those of you that don't know what that is, Annie Armstrong is named after her. She's the founder of the Women's uh, Missionary Union uh, for Southern Baptist. But it really, this offering goes to support North American Mission Board missionaries, which means missionaries in the United States and Canada. It doesn't go for any kind of uh, executive expenses. It goes straight to the ground with missionaries. And so we'd love to reach our goal. And uh, I think the national goal is $1.5 billion. And uh, we, uh, it, it all goes to the ground. So I want you to take a look at this short video, and then uh, we'll receive our offer. It began with a seed, and then it sparked a movement. It covered the continents. It crossed the centuries. Today, Thousands follow those who came before, and now they raise time to share eternal truth. It's all about the gospel. It's all about uh, who Jesus is. It's nothing short of revolution. And we believe that's our God-given mission. They give their all for those who haven't heard. That's what we're doing. Because that's what God put in our This is exactly what I was built to do and designed to do. They stand tall because you pray and give to the Annie Armstrong Easter offering. Well, you know, the front lines of the ministry of the church plant uh, is tremendous uh, spiritual warfare. The Annie Armstrong Easter offering and prayers makes me so strong. They are today's set apart generation. All we can do is be obedient to the task and the call that He's given us. They are your missionaries. Now, I feel I'm not alone. And they are firmly planted. We're the family of God. But don't think it ends there for us. In today's lost world, our roots must spread. This, then, is your time. Pray. Give. Go. Send. Firmly planted. Pray, give, go, and stand. Firmly planted. Join the home beside our missionary. That's what it's about. God, if you'll come forward and receive our offering this morning as we worship. And uh, there's there's a uh, Annie Armstrong Mission offering envelopes there in the queue back, or you can just use uh, yellow envelopes, which many of us do, and then designate which way it goes for your tithe offering. Remember, these offerings go above and beyond your tithe offering. Your tithe offering comes to the church. And, uh, and then your offerings over the time of tithe can be designated. But everything else can become the top of the offering to the church to support the local ministry. So just know that, all right? Let's go to the Lord this morning. Father, thank you for our missionaries. Thank you for our missionaries that serve God in the United States of America, the third greatest mission field right now, North America. Canada, very few people are born again. God, we have opportunities to serve alongside them and, and minister alongside them and give alongside them. Lord, I pray that, Lord, that we would give sacrificially. God, that we would give over and above 
our local time, God, that we're reminded this morning, God, under the commands of God, that we're to give out the first fruits to the local church, to the ministry, without any designation. It's not to be designated any kind of ministry within the church. It's open. But God, that you bless us so that we can go above and beyond and give to the different organizations within the church and about the church. And God, the North American Mission Board, we thank you for what's going on there. So much that happens through disaster relief and just so many other things that happen with our local missionaries. So God, this morning, you've given us the opportunity. you blessed us with the opportunity. So God, I pray that we would give sacrificially to the call of God. Locally, Lord, through the United States, the North American Mission Board, and even abroad as we have opportunities, God. We love you. We praise you. We thank you for this time. In Christ's name.
trust you more. I don't want borders on my trust. I don't want boundaries on my trust. I want border-free faith. Border-free faith. I need boundaries in my life according to the Word of God, according to context and the parameters of the Word of God. For God, the sky's the limit as far as what, what faith can do. That's what faith can do, as the song says. And God, it's the name of Jesus and the blood of Jesus that makes us stop. The blood that's over the doorpost for the Israelites to save them from the death angel is the same blood that covers us under the blood of Jesus from the wages of sin. And God, and then we live according to the bread of life. We live according to the power of the Holy Spirit. We can stand on the promises. We can lean on the everlasting arms if we're washed in the blood because your love never fails and never gives up. Father, I pray if there's anyone on the sound of love that is not washed in the blood of Jesus, that today would be the day of salvation. They may not get another day. When I promise tomorrow, when I promise our next breath. Father, those that are under the blood that have been rescued from Egypt by the mighty power of the blood of Jesus, are we embracing the bread of life and living out what God has said? <laughs> Jesus, Jesus, how I trust you. How I prove you over and over. God, I thank you for your name. Jesus. Thanks. I'll say in chapter 52 this morning. Like a root out of parched ground. 
He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom uh, men hide their face, he was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely our grief he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried, yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him. And by his stripes, by his scurvy, we are healed. All of us, all of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of all of us to fall on him. Think about Romans, what Paul says there, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that's led to slaughter, like a sheep that is silenced before its shearers, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And for his generation who considered uh, that, that, that he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due, or he was struck according to our transgressions. His grave was assigned with wicked men. Yet he was with a rich man in his death, because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. But the Lord was pleased to crush him, to bruise him, putting him to grief or making him sick. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring, he will prolong his days, for it is the will of the Lord that he will prosper in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many, as he will bear their iniquities. Therefore I will allot him a portion with the great, and he will divide the booty with the strong. Because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with transgressors. Yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. What a word from the prophet Isaiah, some 700 or so plus years prior to the Lord Jesus. Let's go to the Lord. Father, empowering the word this morning. God calls us to look at the suffering servant. Over these next weeks, God, as we think about Jesus, his death, his burial, his resurrection, the life that he gives us. God, so many people are confused. So many people are living fogged up lives. God, we have the truth. And God, I'm asking you to give us a boldness. God, we're praying that you do more in these months than you've done in a lifetime. I'm asking you, God, to give us a boldness like we've never had before. I'm asking you to give men a boldness like they've never had. Causing men to take a stand like they've never taken before. Not only in this church, in this community, in this state, but literally around the world. God, that you would cause women to be bold in how they live. And how they live their testimony. Because of the, the actions of God. God, I'm asking you that, Lord, we leave this building this morning. Every man, woman, boy, girl that's left in this building. Those that are in the back that are serving this morning. That we leave differently because we've encountered you through the Holy Spirit of God maybe like we never had before. So God, we commit this time to you that you might deal with me and deal with us with the Word of God for your glory and your burial in Christ. Amen. We think about the suffering servant. We think about the fact that it was written some 700 plus years we, 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 we look at the prophet Isaiah and we look at this as a picture to come. A moment in time that would be taking place. And uh, we now know that being the servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. I find it interesting there that the question was asked in verse 1 of chapter 53. Who has believed our message? What a perfect question for us today. Who today 
In the year 2014, who has believed the message? Have you really believed the message? Have you bought into the message, hook, line, and seeker? Has God made that kind of difference in your life? Think about the time, and we'll look at it probably over these next few weeks, at least mention it at some point. But you think about the question Pilate had. Pilate was in a dilemma. And Pilate asked, what must I do with this man? The man that you call the king of the Jews. What must I do? I think it's a question that's perfect for you and I today. As we go about Rescue 2014, as we think about Jude 23, snatching others from the fire, bringing them to Jesus in order that he can save them. So many of them, <coughs> excuse me, so many folks are asking that same question. Or at least we need to ask them, what must you do with this man called Jesus? Let me ask you this morning, what is your response to the man called Jesus? When you hear that word or that name, Jesus, when we sing it as we did a moment ago, well, what does it do to your life? Is there a, a sense of urgency? Is there a nervousness about the name? Is there just a, the thought of the name Jesus? Does it cause you to flutter maybe a little bit because of the power that's found in Jesus? What must I do with this man that we know as Jesus Christ? One of my devotions yesterday had this. It's, uh, it says, do you love the Lord supremely? And then it asks this question. If you die and they exhumed your body, would they find his name written on your heart? Would they find his name written on your heart? The suffering servant of God. What must I do with this man called Jesus? How, how will you handle Easter? How, how do you plan to handle Easter? How, how do you plan to handle the events in your life? What's most important? Is it all of the commercialism? Is it the family gathering? Is it uh, going here and to and fro? Or is it Jesus? What is it this morning? I, I, I want to just, in this passage of Scripture, use some highlights of it this morning, but to give you some options, not only for you and me this morning, but every person that you and I will come in contact with will fit into these that we're talking about this morning. And, and I want you, you may just turn the worship God over and just write them down as they come up on the screen. <coughs> just so you can think about from the standpoint of touching people's lives. Because every person in this building this morning, along with every person that you and I will encounter this week and all the days leading up to Easter and there are beyond, will fit into some of these areas. And so you and I, here's the thing, I mean, you know about the pennies, the how, how dear they are to me, and, and yesterday I pulled into a drive-thru in Mobile, I went over to make the deliveries, and I pulled into a drive-thru and uh, was, was about to order and, and looked down and there was a penny. And so I made my order and there was a car behind me, and I opened the door and I reached to get the penny, when I did, it, 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 somehow or another it went up on the car. And uh, so I said, well, I'll go on. And when I come back around, there was probably 10 or 12 cars. And so I couldn't get the penny. And I, and I said, God, you know, I, I'm sorry. But it, it just reminded me again of the preciousness of life. And how quick, listen, how quick it can slip away. I mean, all I did was open my, my door and I reached out to get it. But somehow another would come up, I hit the penny just slung out of my hand and went up under the car. And I know what some of you are thinking because you've never heard the story of the penny, but you're going to say, well, it's a penny. What difference does it make? <clears throat> the deal is, is that's the way we treat life. We treat people that way. The people we encounter at Walmart, the people we encounter at the shipyard, wherever you work, in the school system, so many times we encounter them that way. And we just let them slip through the doors. We let them slip through the cracks. But yet some of them are in urgent moments. <clears throat> some of them are in urgent moments. On Friday night or Saturday night, whatever night it was, Saturday Friday night, the men were meeting in the back. And, and uh, I had been helping Jordan back in this thing. I was up in Hurley. My phone rang was Tim. He said, Tim, there's a guy here. 
and his mother's about to die, and, and are they not expecting her to live, and he's wanting to pray with you. Tim and my, Brian are still here. I said, you guys handle it, and I'll be there as quick as I get through eating. And the thing is, is here's the deal. Here's a guy that was in crisis, and God put these two guys here, caused them to be here a little bit late. Everybody else had gone. Just so that they could spend 15, 20, 30 minutes with a guy who needed somebody to pray over. Had been in church. Their members here, but he was, he, he was honest. He said, we've been here 20 years. He lives in Leesville. Those are the pennies that you and I come in contact with each and every day. And as we move up through Easter, you and I have some opportunities to share with Christ with people like we never have before. We have those opportunities at these moments of the year. A lot of activities leading up to that that we're providing with the block party, with pig picking, with Easter, with all these kinds of things that you and I can connect, birthday celebration, whatever, that we can connect with people. <clears throat> and every one of us is going to fall into these categories. The first thing that I want you to see this morning is really like in verse 3, that you and I have a choice that you can despise or reject him. You can despise or reject him. You see, everybody that you and I come in contact with <clears throat> over these next days will be one of those individuals, or could be one of those individuals that despise and re reject him. Verse 3 says that he was despised and forsaken of men. Can I just tell you this morning that that just didn't happen in those times? Now remember, Isaiah's writing some 700 years prior to the coming of 750, 60, 80 years, whatever it is, prior to the coming of the Lord Jesus. Now, you and I are about 2,800 years removed from that. But it's still true. And we still have people <coughs> who despise him and who reject him. <coughs> and here's the thing. When we think about that, the despising and the rejection. We can refuse to have anything to do with Jesus. You have that opportunity. Some of us come and sit in buildings like this week in and week out, but yet we still despise him. We reject him. People come into places like this that they're literally mad at God because of things that have happened in their life. <clears throat> they despise it, but yet they still come. You have the option whether you'll talk about it. Good, positive, or bad. You have the option whether or not you will recognize him. You have the option to where you can just reject him or you can keep him at a distance. <clears throat> and many of us, that's what we do to God. We keep him at a distance. Talk to the hand. We don't let God into our space. And so we have to be careful with that. But you and I run upon people that despise and reject him on a daily basis. Secondly, this morning... You can choose to go your own way. Think about that. It's my life. I'll do with it what I want to. I dare say there's some people in here this morning that that's the way you're living your life. <clears throat> it's my life. I'll make the choices I want to make. I'll say the things that I want to say. And I'll do what I want to do. And if I decide I want to go to church, I go to church. If I want to stay at home, if I don't feel like it, I won't go. Whatever my feelings say, I'm going to do it. Many people choose their course in life. Some people run. You're going to, you're going to find people that have been running from the church a long time. <clears throat> running from, from God for a long time. Simply, things are happening. If you went to see the movie, God's Not Dead. Make a character in there. What was he doing? Hello. Running from God. Running from God. Why? Because as a child, he had lost his parents. And he said, if there's a God, how could this really happen to me? That's where we find people today. You had not seen the movie, you ought to go again. You don't need to go see Noah. Don't waste your money. But God's not dead, you need to go see it. And so we literally say, it's my life, so I'll do with it what I want to. That, that's an option that you can have. And, and you can live a life of preaching. You know, that's, that's where... A lot of folks are today is in a fairy tale, a pretending kind of thing about Jesus. We pretend that he's there. Um, we pretend that maybe we believe. Uh, we, 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 we're not even sure if he's real. 
So we choose life to live in our own way. We make our own decisions. Uh, agnostics. The knowledge of it, but I, you know, I'm not really sure if God exists or not. And he could, but I just don't know. So if you're living, they're living that life going their own way. Blaming others in many cases. There's a lot of people today who says, look, I don't want anything to do with organized church because. And they point the finger. Well, see, what's going to happen if you're one of those people this morning in this building? When you stand before God, it doesn't work. Because you're accountable for you and you're responsible for God. So blaming somebody else for not serving or blaming somebody else because you don't like something, that doesn't hold water with God. And so but that's where so many people are that you and I can encounter leading up to Easter. And uh, the third thing is that you can totally rebel. Wow, we know those people. Those people that, that have become atheists. Matter of fact, the guy, God's not dead, was professing atheist. Actually, he's a Christian in life, but he was living the life of an atheist. What's the difference in an atheist and an agnostic? Tell me, Jim. There's a possibility for an atheist. Okay. Agnostic believes in God. They believe that there is a higher power. Some sort, yeah. They don't believe that there's a personal, you can have a personal. Relationship and an atheist says there is no God. Listen, very few people are born atheists. Most people are made atheists because of something that happens in their life. There's none in the box. There's none in the box. You know, yeah, you've heard that many, many more, many times. And, and the thing is, it's a serious business when you and I begin to think about the fact of rebelling against God. Some of you have said in this building, matter of fact, you're born again, and you can say, I totally rebelled against God. I was totally against everything God had to offer. I've sat down and had conversation even in recent days with somebody that was in that particular place. <laughs> Been there talking to people who are just right there. They were rebelling, but God has moved upon their life, and they moved from rebellion to the point, I believe there is God, God's working in my life, but I'm just not to the point I'm going to give you control of so we're going to find people that totally rebel against God and, and they're going in a total opposite direction of, of what we're talking about. When we think about the suffering servant. It, it, that person who's in total rebellion, who, who is one who really tries to do everything contrary to God and the ways of God. You mentioned church, everything is off the table. Um, and when we think about rebellion, when you think about doing it your own way, <coughs> when we think about the despising and rejecting the Lord Jesus, that's, that's dangerous. It's a dangerous place to live your life. It's a dangerous place. What does the Word of God say about the lukewarm individual? Spit them out of their mouth. He says, I'd rather you be hot or cold. I'd rather you be this person who, who totally rebels than the guy who just says, maybe or if, or I'm here and I'm gone and I'm cold and I'm up and I'm down. He says, I just spit you out of my mouth. It's a dangerous place to be. Uh, rebellion is total betrayal. Now, what do we think about this suffering servant? How do we handle that from that standpoint? Um, you know, when we cover the rebellion, when we cover the ones who despise and reject them, when we cover the ones who decide just to do it their own way, <coughs> what has to happen? First of all, is it, you come to the point that you can acknowledge him. You can acknowledge that there is a God. You can acknowledge, look, there is a higher power that that. The fact is, I believe that, that this Lord Jesus, or this man you call Jesus, this man that you refer to as Jesus, this man that you refer to as the Savior, I can acknowledge that, that maybe he does exist. Now here's the thing, born again believers, that you and I need to understand. You and I have the whole story. We have the full story. We have the beginning and the end. What did Isaiah have? He had the law. That's it. Now, keep in mind, he's prophesied some 2,800 years removed from where we are, okay? And he's telling the story of what's going to happen in the coming Messiah. But yet, he's got it down to the T. And so you and I, listen, we're, we're so much better off than Isaiah because we got the full story. We, we know what happened in the beginning. We know, despite what the movie Noah says, we, we know what took place. We know what happened according to the Word of God. If you believe in creation, and you believe in the God of creation, then you know what the beginning is. And then God gave us the privilege of knowing what's going to happen in the end. Now here's the deal. You and I are living in between. And what we do with Jesus now 
has everything to do with our attention. And what we tell people that you and I encounter has everything to do with their eternity. So you and I need to come to the reality. Listen, we've been told a story. We have the full story, the beginning and the end. And you and I are right smack dab in the middle. Matter of fact, I better I might want to rephrase that because we're kind of on the other side getting real close to the end. We're not sitting in the middle of time somewhere. So we need to be aware of that. Look what Isaiah 52, 15. Look what it says. It says the fact that that, you know. Talking about us being able to even see the forces of God. We're, we're praying that God will do more in these weeks and months than He's done in our lifetime. Look what He says. Does He will sprinkle many nations? We've seen the activity of God. Kings will shut their mouths on account of Him. For what He had been told them, they will see. You and I are seeing the activity of God. Matter of fact, did anybody see, and I didn't get to see the whole commentary. I want to go back and look at it, but I was told that NBC did a commentary with Aunt Curry where she went around the world looking at all the disasters and examining why the things were happening. He might say that. Because when we begin to look and see, we're seeing the forces of God at work like we never have before. That's what they were talking about. It's a phenomenon of Mother Nature. What's happening, we've never seen forces like we're seeing. What does the Word of God say? It's exactly what it says. We're going to see those forces like we've never seen before. We're going to see man against man, woman against woman, nation against nation. Men turning to men, women turning to women. They don't even know if they're men or women. Amen. We're seeing that. So we see the evidence when we think about acknowledging him. Somebody says, well, I want to see it in proof and scientific evidence. Guess what? It's there. Go look at it. I don't have time to keep you all up this morning. I want to see it in archaeological evidence. Guess what? It's there. Take it short to you. You can go see it. It's been in Israel. He's seen it. I've been there. I've seen it. It's there. You and I have the story. And so we have the opportunity to acknowledge God. History defines it for us. That's what Amanda Williams said about teaching her class. She loves teaching history because she's able to tell the story of God in the context of what she's supposed to teach. It's history. And you and I need to apply that. God's desire is that you and I acknowledge the truth, that we step out in faith. And once we acknowledge the truth, then we step to the next step, and then that's the ability to recognize Him. See, that's why the Word of God teaches that everyone will know that there is a God, that there is somebody bigger than Him when they look at nature, when they look at history, when they look at us as individuals. You'll know that there's somebody out there. You're able to acknowledge their God, and then you're able to recognize Him. Recognize him as who? Jesus, the Son of God, the suffering servant, the divine Son and Savior that God sent. It's the suffering servant of God. Look what verse 5 said. Verse 5 said that he was pierced for our transgressions, that he was crushed for our iniquities, that the chastening for our well-being, listen, listen, our well-being, you know what that word well-being is there? The peace the chastening of the Lord Jesus was for our peace. Listen, when you talk to people, listen, some of us in this building this morning, our lives are upside down and we don't have a time of peace. Why not? Because our relationship with the Lord is not where it needs to be. He died, He gave His life according to the Scriptures. Now, not according to this pastor, according to the Scriptures that you and I might have peace. Now, that word peace does not mean that we're not going to have riptides in our life. Doesn't mean that we're not going to have storms in our life. Doesn't mean that. That's not what he's talking about. But what it means is when the riptides come, when the storms come, that you and I will be given a God-given peace that's because of the Lord Jesus and his suffering. And you and I are able to recognize him for who he is. His punishment brought us peace. His punishment, you know, in the time of death, you stand by somebody's bedside who's not born again. And you stand by somebody who's walked with the Lord. And there's a big difference. Even if they're not able to utter a word, there's a big difference. There's a peace about the presence of God when that's a born again believer. It's a peace that only God gives. Why is that peace there? Because of the recognition of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
He was oppressed. He was afflicted. He's Jesus. He's the sinless Son of God. He's the Savior of the world. Listen, by His stripes we are healed, and He is the only way to life eternal. The only way. There is no other way. Some of us in this building are trying to do it some other way. We're going about it our own way. We're rebelling. We're despising. We're rejecting. We're seeking other ways. Jesus is the only way. And we acknowledge Him. We recognize Him. And then we move to this other step of receiving Him. Now some of us in this building are at that point this morning. We've acknowledged Him. We, we've recognized Him. We, we're moving on that point. Verse 6 tells us, for that individual who says, you know, I, I don't know that I've ever gone astray. I, I've been a pretty good person. Remember, I told you about a deacon in a former church who's dead now. But after, I, I, I didn't know him. He died before I got there. But his wife told me, he said, he always questioned whether he needed salvation because he thought he was good enough. And he was an ordained deacon. What does the Word of God say? It says, all of us, like sheep, have gone astray. By the Lord, uh, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of all of us. By the way, when you're looking at that in your translation, you probably figured this out. But it says, but the Lord, that's Jehovah. Jehovah has caused the iniquity of all of us to fall on who? Him, Jesus, the Son of God, the suffering servant. And the depiction that's being made there. So each of us has, has had the opportunity to turn uh, from our wicked ways, that, uh, from our own way. And uh, there is a better way. There's the best way. And it's God's way. It's Jesus' way. And, uh, you know, God knows the road you're on. You, you know the road you're on. You know the life you're living. Some of you have made a profession of faith and you've never followed through with public profession of faith. you never followed through with believer's baptism. You never follow on through. And I'm not saying baptism and saved you. Don't understand that. Don't misunderstand that. But the fact is, that's part of being obedient to the Lord Jesus Christ. Publicly professing Jesus before a people, saying that I acknowledge him as my Lord and Savior, that he is the Son of God. He's changed my life, and I want you to know it. I want to live. I want you to hold me accountable, and I want to live for him. That's the importance of public profession. That's the importance of, of, of baptism that we identify with the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because it's the best way. It's God's way. And uh, that verse 6, that latter part says that God laid on Jesus the entire sin of the world. Listen, that's past, present, and future. You think he had a weight on his shoulders on the cross? And all of that, listen, all that was done to him, the scourge. By his stripes, by his scourging, we are healed. The Word of God says all of that that was done to him never opened his mouth. What does that mean? He never complained. What did, what did he say? Father, Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them for, for, for they don't know what they do. Even in the Garden of Gethsemane, the, the toughest moments in his life before the cross, he knew what was before him. Sweat drops of blood. God, if this cup can pass from me, let it, but not my will, but your will. It's a suffering servant of God. See, that's where we need to get to this morning. Listen, every one of us in this building need to get to the point to say, God, not my will. It ain't about me, God, but it's all about you. It's what you want, God. It's what needs to happen in my life. Listen, Lord Jesus was hung according to the Word of God. He was hung between two thieves. Hung between two thieves. A place he didn't deserve. Sinless Son of God hung between two, King James says, malefactors. The same penalty that the malefactors had was the penalty of our Will you receive him this morning? Will you receive what he's done? You can't pay him for it. You, you can't earn it. He's already done it for you. You just need to accept it. He's the suffering servant, Jesus Christ. You can despise him. You can reject him. You can go your own way and say, I'll do it tomorrow. 
but tomorrow it never comes. You can say I'm just rebelling to heck with that stuff. I don't want anything to do with it. It's going to be a price to pay. Or you can acknowledge it, you can recognize it, you can receive it. There's one last thing. You can reward it. I want you to think about that now. You can recognize it, you can receive it, and you can reward it. See, you can't buy your salvation. You can't get good enough to get the salvation, but you can reward it. No. Remember what I told you a moment ago on the first question? What is your response to this man called Jesus? What is your response to Easter? Do we care more about the eggs than we care about the death, burial, and resurrection? Do we care more about the chocolate than we do the blood? What really makes the difference? It's the suffering servant of Jesus. And you see, when we reward him, what that means is, Lord Jesus, I acknowledge you as the Son of God. I acknowledge myself as a sinner that's separated from the Holy God because of my sin, not because of somebody else, because of, some, because of mine. And Lord Jesus, I ask you this morning to forgive me of my sin, to take my life, and change it. Here's the reward. Lord, I lay my life down. And I will live my life in obedience to you. Serving you in the kingdom. Doing, God, what you've called me to do. God, I will be obedient. I'll give you control of my life. I will submit to you. I will receive you. And I will submit and I will live for you. I will tell the truth. Why? Because I believe in your king of kings. You're the Son of God. You're the suffering servant that went to the cross for my sin. You paid a price for Jesus that you didn't know. You paid a price that I certainly couldn't pay. And Lord Jesus, today I deserve a sinner's death. Because of your death, I get heaven. So I want to live my life with you. And here's the thing that we close. You know, last week we closed with Colin playing the trumpet. And he played the pass. And I'm sure unless you bought him back, there was a tear that formed. Because anytime you hear the taps, there's a stirring moment in life because of what it stands for. But here's the thing, ladies and gentlemen, and young people this morning. One day the trumpet's going to sound. And it's not going to play the stack, the taps. It's going to play the victory of the Lord Jesus to come. Now I want to ask you, if we move forward into this Easter season, are you truly born again? And if you're truly born again, are you living your life in honor of the Lord Jesus? Is your life a reward for the terrible price that he paid on Calvary's cross? When you die, if your body could be exhumed and an autopsy performed, <coughs> would you find this name written in your heart? It's back. Jim, praise King of God. Thank you. We enter this time with invitation.